Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Happy Easter, Christ is risen. And say what you like about little Macron, but he has stepped up to the plate, and I'll be the first to praise him in this show at least. And Donald Trump's legal travails slump from tragedy into farce as every legal brain in America says that the district attorney in Manhattan is talking out of his hat or some orifice or other. And a luxury motorhome, grand and big enough to house an entire Ukrainian refugee family, has sat unused on the pavement outside the 92-year-old mother-in-law of former Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon's house. It has not turned a wheel in two whole years. Who knew? These Ukrainians that she was welcoming could have had a billet there. We'll be talking also about Georgia, which many people are hoping will be a second front, although I'm not sure it needs any more fronts against Russia. And Taiwan is currently encircled by hundreds of Chinese Air Force and naval planes hoping to send a powerful message that provocations like that mounted by the US government this weekend will not be tolerated. Mind you, Lindsey Graham says he's open to sending troops to Taiwan, but then Lindsey's always open, if you get my drift. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night, as Betty Davis once said, because it's the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Happy Easter to the Western Confessions of Christianity. Happy Easter next weekend to the Eastern and Orthodox churches. I spent my Easter in Seville, which was a truly magnificent, magnetic occasion. The processions in the old city of Christ in the Passion on the cross of Mary and all sculpted beautifully was such powerful religious imagery. It really was something to behold. What spoiled it for me were the very large number of men in hoods and pointy hats. It was very difficult to explain to my children what they were wearing the pointy hats for. I said it was for penitence. They know that that means for people who've done bad things, but they couldn't understand why wearing a ponte hat would be any kind of cure for doing bad things. But it was magnificent. My boy, my youngest boy, Torren, is training with Real Madrid this week, and hence we were in Seville. Now, it's Easter, and heads are rolling. Principally, the head of the husband of the former First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, sometimes known, perhaps unfairly, as Mr. Nicola Sturgeon. She came out and gave a doorstep press conference, but she kept her left hand in her jeans pocket throughout the entire interview, leading to speculation that you can throw your money off the bus after all. He has been arrested and released without charge, but unpending further investigation and it has transpired that on the very morning he was being huckled in the couple's marital home a few miles away at Nicola's mother-in-law's home she's a poor old lady of 92 a luxury 110,000 pound mobile home or caravan dormobile as my mother would call them was being carted off by the police it had not moved since the day it was delivered 
two years ago, a period of time which may be material in the police investigations. Why anyone would buy a £110,000 mobile home and then not drive it anywhere, not move it out of the cul-de-sac of a 92-year-old woman remains to be revealed. But if the police are putting it up for auction, I would like to buy it and I'll take it round Scotland in an anti-SNP roadshow. How's that for a deal? I'll accept uh, contributions so that we can raise the necessary to buy it. I think it would be the ultimate irony. We'll keep you posted on what's happening on that legal case more clearly than the SNP will, for transparency is not their middle name. I thought when the cops were searching the marital home garden, they'd find a mountain of laptops that were promised to the children of Scotland prior to the last election, but never delivered. Or a collection of bicycles, which were equally promised to the children of Scotland before the last election, but like the mobile home, have never turned a wheel. But enough of the travails of Scotland. I must not be uh, a little uh, parish pump patriot. I must cast my eyes across the world. Now say what you like about President Macron. He, with the chutzpah for which he is famous, justifiably, rightly famous, chose the moment when all of France was on fire, when millions of French people were out on the street on strike, storming public buildings, setting fire to town halls, occupying airports and railway stations, taking over railway lines. Millions upon millions of French people were revolting and their revolting little president decided to go to China. But that's where my insulting of Macron will stop. Well, maybe just one more insult. He is a very small man, as we all know. He was not up to the shoulders of President Xi Jinping of China, but they seem to have gotten along quite well. And I think that that is important and praiseworthy because when the United States is openly proselytizing uh, for uh, a posse to fight China on their behalf in yet another US proxy war, when Europe is lying down I better not go further with that metaphor in mixed company, but you know what I'm thinking. Up stepped President Macron to insist on going to Beijing and talking properly, politely, diplomatically to the Chinese leadership. And I think he's probably done France a favor in that and may have done the rest of us an even bigger one. Because Macron after the talks, which were cordial, took place in Beijing, but also went to Zhangzhou, the uh, home of President Xi Jinping's father, his father a very historic figure in the Chinese People's Revolution. As a matter of fact, Xi Jinping said to Macron, if he wanted to stay a little bit longer, he could stay in his father's home, which I suspect is not an offer he makes to many people. So the talks clearly went well. They were, of course, slightly harmed by the baggage that Macron had been forced to bring with him. Ursula von der Leyen, the German uh, Christian Democrat, who most people are keen to move on from whichever job she is in, moved on from German politics to European politics, about to be moved on from European politics to run as head of NATO. She was there yapping away uh, like a little dashhund uh, at the ankles of Xi Jinping, but the Chinese treated her with the contempt that she deserved. When she was leaving the country, she got no diplomatic niceties and had to queue, like me and Gayatri, at the nothing to declare aisle as they went through uh, the rather splendid new Beijing airport. She's not a diplomat and she's not a head of government. As a matter of fact, I'm not entirely clear what she is, but she qualified for no diplomatic red carpets, that is for sure. And her conduct there was such that she brought shame 
on the European Union. But Macron, on the other hand, said some very, very important things. He declared that France will not be dragged into a state of belligerence against China on, for any reason, and certainly not, because the United States wants to create a casus belli over Taiwan. Macron explicitly ruled that out. And, of course, he was touting for business for France. And why shouldn't he? That's the job of a national leader, after all, to do the best for their own country. I wonder where the British government are in... Does Britain even have a government? I actually have not set eyes on or heard anything from the British Prime Minister in many weeks. He's not present at any diplomatic negotiation with potential foes in issues that are potential tank traps for humanity because, of course, his instructions, like Tony Blair's in 2001 before him, were to get up the ass of the United States of America and stay there. Well, that's an uncomfortable, unpleasant place to be. But that's where our government, the British government, is. But the conduct of Macron in China and the progress made by Macron in China is bound to have caused a ripple or two in Germany because Germany was the leading industrial powerhouse on the European continent. It has been de-industrialized, de dismantled as well as plunged into a freezing winter with another freezing winter still to come. Of course, like the 7th Cavalry led by John Wayne, uh, American LNG is coming over the ocean but at four times the price of the gas they used to get very cheaply and reliably from Russia. So the German political situation is extremely brittle and there they see the leader of France, their traditional foe and their rival inside the European Union, making hay with Xi Jinping in China. You can also say that Macron distanced himself from the US over Ukraine. I certainly read it that way. When he said that there was no excuse for anyone deploying new nuclear weapons, least of all in Europe, who else could he have been talking about but the United States of America? They're the only people who are moving new nuclear weapons and they're doing it into Europe. So when Macron said that, you could argue it was uh, diplomatically expressed, but nonetheless a slap in the face of Joe Biden. No way, of course, that Joe Biden would notice. His dotage has slipped into utter insensibility. He has gone from early onset to late stage Alzheimer on camera in real time as President of the United States of America. This may be the point to remind you that at the bottom of his bed, literally, is the football. What's the football? It is the bag containing the triggers for firing nuclear weapons. And as I've joked before, but it's no longer a joke, he's going to get out of bed looking for the toilet in a hurry one night, and he may just do something to that bag that brings about the end of the world. How long the United States armed forces, how long the United States governing party, how long the United States system is going to tolerate a man so embarrassingly senile as their best, as their number one, as their big hombre, as the big guy, must be a matter of some speculation. Certainly, there's now a candidate declared running against him for the Democratic Party nomination in the presidential election in 2024. That man is Robert Kennedy Jr. Now, someone said to me uh, that uh, Biden is senile, Kamala Harris is unpopular, but RFK Jr. 
uh, has too low a profile. But with respect, sir, nobody called Robert Kennedy can possibly be low profile. This is a man whose father should have been the President of the United States and how different the world would have been if he had become President in 1968 before someone, my money is on the CIA, gunned him down in the back, not the front of the head, in a kitchen in California. He was on his way to the nomination at the convention in Chicago. He would undoubtedly have won. And so they killed him because, like his brother and his uncle, similarly murdered, again, my money, on the CIA, was ready to embark upon a series of political changes in America that would deeply have discomfited the ruling elite, the real rulers of America, both JFK and RFK had the quaint and unusual idea that the elected president of the United States ought to dictate to the military industrial complex, to the intelligence industrial complex, and if RFK Jr. gets in, to the media and high tech industrial complex. That puts a bit of a target on RFK Jr. His family don't want him to run, but he's running. And I think we should treat seriously the claims to the presidency of RFK Jr. He has proved to be a wise, sagacious, and perhaps above all, courageous man. He stood against the tide over the COVID, over the vaccines, over the masks, over the closures and the lockdowns. I didn't go myself all the way with him, still don't go all the way with him. But you've got to admire a man so ready to stand out against the tide when there was nothing in it for him to do so and plenty of brickbats and bans and shadow banning in order to continue his work. But now he's off and running. And he said something yesterday which I think has succinctly summed up where the ruling elite in America have put their country and their people. He said, the United States has forced Russia and China together in an unbreakable alliance. They have wrecked the dollar as the world's reserve currency. They have made a mockery in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, and with their ridiculous pirouetting around the issue of Taiwan, made the United States a laughing stock amongst public opinion around the world. And who can dispute that? Only the most partisan or someone paid to do so, like that joker that runs the White House press operation. Where did they get her? Well, from Haiti. She ticked a lot of boxes and that's why she got the job, but she cannot do the job. And the more I see of her, the more emblematic it seems to me that she is of the extraordinary, rapid and almost cataclysmic decline of United States power and influence in the world. If you don't believe me, go to Beijing now. See if you can get a hotel room because all roads lead to Beijing where once they used to lead to Camp David and the White House lawn. We'll be talking about all these issues and more, much more, and taking your calls in the course of the next one hour and 40 minutes. Because, as I keep saying, this is the mother of all talk shows. Mr. President, we got a report of a 50-foot woman marauding through Washington, sir. Thank you, Captain. But I'm looking for a shorter woman, one who likes to take long strolls in the park and yell at minorities. She's not looking for a date. She's terrorizing the city. Is there a difference? <laughs>
<laughs> a little levity. Call in the military. <clears throat> we are the military, sir. Boy, we got here fast. We better do something, right? Shall I scramble the jets, Mr. President? No, thanks. I'll just take a muffin and some coffee. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, if you want to comment on anything I've said or didn't say, or anything my guests say or don't say, here are the numbers. If you're in the UK and Ireland, free of charge, by the way, it's 0808196552. That's 0808196552. If you're in the US or Canada, again, completely free of charge, it's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one. 844-944-3344. And if you're in the rest of the world, which most people are, let's face it, it's 442039662625. Now we've got a poll running. It doesn't read well for Biden, but even less well for Kamala Harris. Oh, where did they get her? Uh, which Democrat could win the 2024 US election? could win. Not would win, will win, but could win. A. Joe Biden, B. Kamala Harris, C. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's incredible, the numbers. 12,000 people have voted so far and the show's only just begun. The answers so far on Twitter, A. Joe Biden, 8%. He's the sitting president, I remind you. B. Kamala Harris, the vice president, 5%. RFK, 87%. 3,000 people have voted on Twitter. Uh, another 1,000 have voted on YouTube. Biden, 7%. Harris, 3%. RFK, 90%. On Telegram, Biden, 8%. Harris, 3%. Kennedy, 89%. And on the YouTube community poll, 7,200 people have voted. Biden, 9%. Harris 5%, Kennedy 86%. So it's go, Kennedy, go. Where have we heard that slogan before? Now, uh, Robert Barnes is a constitutional lawyer of note in the United States, a legal eagle who watches like a hawk the politicization of American justice, if justice it can still be called. Now, if you haven't seen Lionel's interview with me on Wednesday, you missed a treat. He's another legal eagle in New York, but Robert Barnes, dare I say it, is an even more eminent one. And he joins us now. But thank you uh, for joining us. Um, let's deal with the, the, the constitutional import uh, of the Donald Trump case first off. Because in the rest of the world, people associate incoming governments putting the last government on trial, criminalizing them, lawfaring them, as being one of the characteristics of a banana republic. The United States is now doing this for the first time. Does that mean you've become a banana republic? Well, under the Biden administration, it would probably be appropriate, uh, given the nature of the president himself and his mental state. But there's no question that this uh, raises significant and serious constitutional questions we've never had to address before. Uh, as you note, America has never indicted a former president. America has never indicted the leading opponent of the existing administration. We've mostly targeted outsiders when this has happened. So it did happen to presidential candidates. Eugene V. Debs for opposing World War I was locked up. Now, he was still allowed to be on the ballot because you can't prohibit him from being on the ballot by indictment. Uh, but that's the closest we've come to overtly and openly weaponizing the, the local prosecutorial process to go after our political opposition. And we usually, as you note, make fun of it when it happens anywhere else in the world and use it as a sign that that country is not a democratic country, not a constitutional country. 
in, in the U.S., arguably our U.S. Constitution already prohibits this. It, it, it does identify when a former president can be indicted or tried or sentenced or criminally punished. And it's only after he's been impeached in the House and convicted by more than a two-thirds vote in the Senate. It then says, then you can remove him from office. Then you can remove him and bar him from future office. Then you can charge him in a criminal case. So arguably this indictment by itself violates the con that constitutional uh, prohibition uh, because there's been no conviction vote in the Senate. Trump has been twice impeached, but twice acquitted. Uh, and these charges and these claims were known before then. But this case is unique in that it involves all kinds of other constitutional issues, some of them novel. Uh, beyond the impeachment clause provision limitation on indicting former presidents, which include whether it's a due process violation for the part opposite party to indict their leading opponent in the upcoming election for the presidency, whether or not a local government can do this against the interest of the nation, uh, the, the issues of constitutional federalism that that implicates. And then, of course, that doesn't even get to the constitutional violations of the nature of the indictment itself, because it appears to try to criminalize free speech by making uh, activity, uh, any activity, a campaign donation that merely supports a campaign as an ancillary or incidental benefit, which raises First Amendment freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of press, right to petition the government issues. Uh, then you have issues of due process of law as to whether or not they violated the statute of limitations in bringing the case, whether or not they violated uh, giving exculpatory evidence and not providing perjured testimony and false law to the grand jury in the case, whether or not the judge has a bias in the case that's violating and the DA, because both of them have been involved with Trump's opposition, uh, the judge giving contributions to Biden and his family being tied to the Biden family in political ways, the prosecutor running on uh, prosecuting Trump, which arguably violates the selective prosecution prohibition under our First Amendment. So all kinds of extraordinary constitutional issues in this unprecedented, unparalleled, banana republic-like indictment of President Trump. Well, as you adumbrated what can only be described as a tsunami uh, of indictments of uh, the indictment and those uh, bringing it, I wondered how it can possibly survive and how people with a straight face could lend their support to it. Although when Biden was asked uh, if, uh, if this was uh, political, uh, he, he actually broke out in peals of laughter. Whether he understood the question, of course, is a moot uh, point. But nobody listening to what you've just said could be in any doubt at all that this is an absurdly, almost comically, uh, political move. Completely. I mean, it, it's terrifying. I mean, I think the Democratic response and even the nature of the indictment itself was a lot of confession through projection. I tell people if they want to know what's going on, say, in Ukraine, uh, take the accusations made about Russia and assume it's about the West or Ukraine, and you'll probably have an accurate testimony. Uh, if you want casualty counts, you know, reverse the projections and you'll probably have an actual an accurate uh, attestment. The same is true here. In other words, they've accused what they've indicted Trump for is what the Biden administration, what Joe Biden himself is, what Hillary Clinton uh, and even Barack Obama, in many respects, as testimony developed this week, are actually guilty of which are, you know, funneling illegal contributions, using their family to engage in institutional corruption uh, around the globe. Uh, the, I mean, Hillary Clinton famously uh, used a, disguised her Russiagate uh, work that was planted and laundered through the FBI to spy on the president and uh, not only to promote a deep state narrative to oppose uh, any peace deal with Russia, but also to uh, propagate an anti-Trump campaign that they knew was false from day one. And how did they do it? They disguised it as legal fees. So that's where you read the indictment. And if you applied it to Hillary Clinton, the indictment might actually make sense. If you applied it to Barack Obama, it might make sense. If you applied it to Joe Biden, it might make sense. It just makes no sense as to Donald Trump. 
And so there's a lot of confession through projection in the nature of these criminal charges and prosecutions. But you're right. This is not a credible prosecution, uh, not as a matter of law. You have independent liberal Democratic legal scholars like Professor Jonathan Turley, like Professor Alan Dershowitz, calling it the worst and weakest case they've ever witnessed. And this is the one we crossed the constitutional Rubicon for. This is the one we decided to breach our precedent uh, of never indicting former presidents and leading presidential opponents for was a case that Alan Dershowitz calls the weakest he's ever seen. And that's because it's also factually weak. I mean, they, they, they can't make they, they're basically relying on a lawyer who's an admitted self-confessed perjurer, fraudster and liar. Uh, and he himself can't can't uh, make a consistent determination as to what he did because the prosecutor needs him to keep changing it because their legal theory, depending on the circumstances, has to change in case one theory is dismissed as insufficient as a matter of law. And in the nature of this case, for example, if the president the, uh, in America have a First Amendment right to give as much money to your own campaign as you like. So if he was the one paying off Stormy Daniels, even if it were it was solely for a campaign purpose, that's patently constitutionally protected and completely lawful and legal, unlike what Hillary Clinton did with the Russiagate dossier, unlike what Barack Obama was trying to do in getting a $30 million contribution from one member of the Fugees, as Leonardo DiCaprio testified this week, unlike what the Clintons did in the 1990s in mass. Uh, this was entirely lawful. And so instead, they're going to try to suggest that maybe he didn't really want to give it the money, then maybe he did want to give him the money, and maybe it was part of the plan, and maybe it wasn't part of the plan. This is why the indictment's extraordinary, and it says that Trump violated a federal law, but fails to even tell him which law it was he violated. That's how nuts it is. So from a legal perspective, from a factual perspective, from a political perspective, it may be the worst and weakest indictment ever brought. And as you note, what it really is, is an indictment of the American criminal justice process that has been so politically weaponized, it can be used in a way that makes America a laughingstock to the world. Uh, indeed, laughingstock is the phrase I quoted uh, RFK Jr. Uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, and this is another part of the laughingstock. I mean, you are famous for continuing to call ex-presidents, Mr. President. If Trump were to go to jail, he would have to be accompanied in jail by his Secret Service detail, uh, who would have to protect him uh, inside the jail. And the, is this really all about paying money to a, a slattern, as my good friend Lionel dubbed her? Uh, that's what they're trying to make it about. But in fact, I think they thought it would politically embarrass uh, Trump. But the reality is uh, Trump, the, that was baked into the cake politically about Trump. Uh, nobody thought that he was necessarily a paragon of Sunday school virtue when it came to his personal life. Uh, now, Trump, of course, has denied there ever was an affair. Stormy Daniels has at different times denied there was an affair. It depends on the circumstances. But it's a, very much like what happened with Clinton uh, in the 90s. And that, you know, when they decided for various reasons they couldn't go at the real corruption, they went after Monica Lewinsky, and that backfired in the court of public opinion. And this will, as and already has as well, I think they really thought it would take Trump out, that it would allow DeSantis a path to the presidency. Uh, and DeSantis has been a deep state recruit for a very long time, going back to his days at Yale and Harvard, Guantanamo and Fallujah. You don't get those kind of assignments unless you've got some key patrons and allies inside the military industrial complex. And they were convincing him to run on the grounds that Trump would be taken out politically by these indictments. Uh, but looking at Georgia, looking at D.C. But the reality is the country looks at this and they see it as an embarrassment. They see it as a joke. They see it as a crock. Even a majority of Democrats in some public opinion polls say this is a political indictment, not a law-based indictment. And so I think it shows how weak the deep state is in the West, uh, how scared they are of, of Trump or anybody challenging, questioning, contesting deep state power. Uh, much as uh, President Kennedy did, much as uh, Robert Kennedy did, much as Robert Kennedy Jr. is now doing uh, by campaigning for the presidency. So I think it reflects ultimately their weakness rather than their strength that all they could come up with as a manufacturer is that somebody who was the victim of extortion, that's what Trump was here. So Stormy Daniels was connected to some extortion-related lawyers. Her former lawyer, Michael Avenatti, is in federal prison as we speak for doing what? Extortion. So Trump was basically the victim of extortion. His lawyer pays it off to avoid embarrassment to Trump's wife, Melania, and now Trump is the one being prosecuted. 
It is utter insanity. But it's what happens when you breach the dam of lawfulness in America. Once you go after people like Julian Assange and you try to criminalize the freedom of press and freedom of speech anywhere in the world, chances are that dam is going to break and it's going to reach more people in more protected categories, and that's what sadly happened. Finally, and Counselor, you are good, I must say. Uh, where does this go from here? What's the next stage we should be looking out for? So the president's going to bring motions to recuse because the judge has issues of bias. The prosecutor has issues of bias motion or motions to disqualify are sometimes called here in America. The judge apparently was trying to do secret donations under disclosure requirements to the Biden administration. I mean, you just can't make this stuff up. Uh, then you're going to have motions to potentially transfer the case from Manhattan to Staten Island. Then you have motions to dismiss on constitutional grounds, statute of limitations grounds, failure to even state what crime he's being charged with grounds. So you're going to have a lot of legal activity before you ever reach a trial. You may never get a trial. And if the courts are honest in New York, they'll just dismiss this case and move on and just let it be a perilous precedent that's never repeated, hopefully, in America's near future. And meanwhile, Trump goes on. Any noticeable dip in his morale over the whole thing? Not at all. It's one thing that they think they, a lot of confession through projection in that kind of like what you see with Russia and Ukraine in the sense that they they try to project onto Putin a weakness and cowardice that they themselves often have. They project, they figure if they were prosecuted, they would run for cover. Trump's always been just the opposite. If you punch him in the mouth, he's going to come back and punch you twice. He's a true New Yorker, but from the outer boroughs. Uh, he's a Queens man at heart. And the uh, that's why he got into trouble in prep school was when he was beating up the other uh, kids. So the, uh, the nature of him is he doesn't respond well to being bullied, and he, he has rebounded back twice. In fact, he's got more energy than he had before, and the whole country and the, his base is rallying behind him. So I think the deep state bought off a lot more than they can chew in this case. Is his wife standing by him? Oh, completely, and she sees it for what it is. Uh, and, you know, it's probably true with Trump. Uh, Stormy Daniels may not be on that list. Uh, Trump has uh, even Trump has certain standards. Uh, so the, he might not have gone, uh, gone that route. So I think that's what Melania assumes. A, a different a accuser might have caused her a little more consternation than Stormy Daniels. Robert Barnes, you are a revelation. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Wow. What a guest. Which Democrat could win the 2024 U.S. election? Uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, or RFK Jr.? That's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, 13,000 people have voted. Get your vote in before the end of the show. Let me take a quick break. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. Uh, emails are coming in on air at moats.tv. This one from John Mayer or Meyer, M E Y E R. George, where did you get your courage from to stand up to the United States on the Iraq question? And how is it that you never disappeared? Is the CIA scared of Tony Blair? Nobody else had the courage to do so best, John. I'm afraid, John, only of God and the Judgment Day. Nobody else in the whole world with the possible exception of my wife scares me 
at all. Here's the phone numbers 0808196552 if you're in the UK or Ireland. In the US, plus 1844944334. And the rest of the world, 442039662625. Wow, the phones have lit up on the RFK issue. Erobos, our sage, a legend. I'm designating him now as a legend from New York. Erobos, welcome to the show. I gather you're not too keen on RFK's tilt at the nomination. Is that right? As is my way, I have to uh, say salubrious night to you and your family and your supporters. As you may know, it's very important to me. I, I never take life for granted, though I'm not a religious man myself. I've experienced too many uh, people transitioning out of this life to just, you know, say it can't happen to me or anyone I care about. So I need to get that out the way, as is my way. However, um, uh, no. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I want to remind people, and, and this is the thing, and, and I'm not trying to uh, throw shade on RFK. I've actually met him once or twice. Um, and I don't have any issues with him, unlike, you know, Bernie, per se. However, the, the Bernie uh, syndrome is very much alive and well here. You know, we have to remember that in 2017, the court affirmed um, that the DNC uh, and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who is basically a, a mini, mini, mini Hillary, she's a mini, mini Hillary Clinton or a Hillary clone, that they had a right to rig their uh, elections. They had a right to rig their primaries against Bernie Sanders. And this came from a court, right? So an RFK, he, he literally has been involved in politics all his life. He, he literally is born into a political family. His very existence is nothing but politics. I don't think there's anybody alive in America that knows more about the political situation than him from the un inside and out. So I, I, am, um, I am genuinely nonplussed and, and frustrated as to why he's taking this process, because if we remember what happened with Bernie, after he was, uh, and, and I worked as a poll worker for the uh, city of New York uh, general elections, and I saw how they were re-diverting, you had people that were voting in the same poll site for 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, and they were purposely being redistricted and, and, and sent away on the day of the election. So that was pulling a lot of votes away from people who, would, who they knew they were going to vote for Bernie. However, the point is, he knows all of this. And in the end, what happened to Bernie is, um, and Nick Browner, uh, who actually worked for Bernie, at the time, can and uh, Adam Braid a lot better about this issue. However, what Bernie did is what he turned over his email list, which had all the donations, contacts, millions of people, tens of millions of dollars. You know, he bent the knee, as they say in the Game of Thrones. Uh, he bent the knee, and he, he turned all that over to Hillary Clinton and told people to vote for Hillary Clinton. So I'm not saying RFK is going to be a, a repeat of that. It's just... When, when you knowingly take a path to failure, because if they didn't let Bernie, who is now pro-establishment, he's 100% behind Joe Biden, it, it, it's, it's pathetic. However, when you, when you know what they did to someone ahead of you, and you're taking the same road, and, and Bernie was an independent that decided to join, you know, a quote-unquote an independent. The truth is he's been part of the uh, Vermont Democratic machine since 1990. Um, yeah, so you know this is going to happen, and you know they're going to pull, they're going to rug you, they're going to pull the carpet from under his feet. You know, if he ran as an independent or third party, I'd have took him a lot more seriously. In fact, I would have been boosting him. But now you're inside the same machine that you know is going to harbor you. I just, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think um, my spidey sense, as they say, you know, my my hackles are up about this. But I just wanted to share this perspective. And again, I'm not hating yeah, I saw on it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I knew that that was your view because I read it uh, earlier today. 
And of course, I have a lot of sympathy with it. But the ultimate betrayal that Bernie Sanders uh, made was not to use the platform he had built whilst pursuing the Democratic Party nomination to launch a third party challenge. Um, now, of course, RFK might not make that mistake or commit that foul. Uh, he may very well run uh, to be the Democratic Party nomination. After all, he is a part of the party's royal family, you might say. Uh, and if they cheat him as they cheated Bernie, he may then use that as a springboard for a run as a third party candidate with very high name recognition. What do you say? I, I hope that's I hope that's the plan. I don't I don't know him all that well. Uh, I think uh, Nick, uh, our, our chair of the People's Party, knows him a lot better than I do. And maybe um, I can get him to call, if not this week or maybe Wednesday, and see if he could. Sure. Um, you know, maybe he did speak to RFK already. I don't know. Uh, these are things that are going on behind the scenes. I, I hope that's his play, because if not, it'll just be a repeat of 2016, and people are already demoralized, hurt, betrayed, and um, I hope that's not what he's doing, because he'll, he'll definitely put an end to the Kennedys, whatever, whatever is good of the legacy of the Kennedy name. I hope that's not what he's doing, for his sake and the country's. Okay, a brilliant call, superb, from New York. Let's go to Seattle on the same subject, where Nathan has a point of view. Nathan, what would you like to say? Uh, well, you made a lot of the points I wanted to make uh, to the gentleman ahead of me. But um, my uh, hope is that this is a two-pronged uh, effort. Like, you know, my birthday weekend is this, uh, this weekend. I was just saying that my only wish is that we have a French-like revolution going on, uh, you know, because we need to scare politicians into uh, working for the constituency and not, uh, the corporation. So if we run up in all these two big to fail banks and BlackRock America edition, um, I feel like that would that would put pressure on the proper people instead of us getting mad at each other. And, uh, you know, what pronouns you want to call people and burning Bud Light. We have a, a unified effort to focus on the actual criminals who are robbing us blind. I have a lot of faith in uh, RFK Jr., uh, because I, I do uh, think that he's genuine because both of his, he had two family members who were killed by the CIA, you know, uh, and I, be speaking as someone who um, was affected by the military uh, industry, um, you know, like that dedicates one's purpose. Like uh, you become focused on uh, the correct enemy. And he has a, uh, I was on here, <laughs> you know, earlier in the week, um, speaking about like uh, my, my love of uh, RFK because I do believe he's a fighter because before, you know, all of this COVID stuff came to light, he's, you know, he was a lawyer uh, fighting against the pharmaceutical companies uh, trying to expose all the corruption. And uh, that gives me faith. You know, Bernie has, I'm, I'm happy to hear him when he talks about uh, Medicare for all, but uh, he's not willing to fight for it in a pandemic. He's not willing to fight for it. I understand your concerns with Bernie. He's like totally lost, <laughs> but uh, RFK, I think he's a a, a beast of a, a different nature, and um, and I would love and if he did kowtow and tell tell us to get behind Joe Biden, I'd be right with the other caller. Like, what what is going on? Because that's what happened when with Bernie. You know, we we had to vote against racism by voting for someone who gave a eulogy at a Klan member uh, a funeral. So you know, I I can't get behind that, but. Uh, um, you know, if you're worried about RFK getting the streets, let's get the movement, uh, uh, the, 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 the feet on the ground, uh, so we get uh, uh, affected uh, outside of the political uh, realm, which I know is correct. Well, I, I'll tell you what, uh, I mean, Nathan, your uh, perspective and the robots is, are, are not, of course, diametrically opposed at all and may be characterized as tactical in nature. Uh, but we'll see, there's apparently comments are flooding in on the subject. So we'll take as many calls as we can, as well as comments on the subject. Uh, YouTube Super Chats are now flooding in. Dr. Tolstoyevsky sends 
His usual two pounds. Thank you. Says Happy Easter. I'm watching you as always. Thank you, Doctor. And my good friend, comrade Daniela Modus Kuta sends one ninety nine. Thank you, Daniela. Cooler King seventy four sends two U S dollars. Happy Easter from Kentucky. And Camel Tanis sends six ninety nine Canadian dollars. The amazing Blumpkin sends five U S dollars. R F K Junior for president. Judge Napolitano for VP, Colonel McGregor as Secretary of Sanity. That sounds like quite a good platform. Ian Robert Horton, 199. If you really want to know the truth, tune in to GG. Thank you, Ian. Michael Sherry sends five pounds. The Trump prosecution means that the Dems can't lose power again because they will get lawfare to death by the Republicans. Well, Michael, if you live by the sword, <laughs> you die by the sword. Elvis, he's back, sends 10 pounds. My God, please bring Robert back. His legal knowledge is amazing. God bless GG for bringing to the world a genuine alternative perspective to the rubbish on mainstream media like BBC, CNN, Sky News, etc. Thank you, Elvis. And I too was stunned by the eloquence and erudition of Robert Barnes. Uh, Peter is in the Isle of Wight in England or just off the coast. Let's hear from him. Peter, what would you like to say? Oh, good evening, George. And uh, good evening to all your um, you... viewers as well. And much love to everybody. Um, what it is, is it, um, the, with, with Mariupol, you know, we've been led to believe that it's rack and ruins, left for dust, and Russia destroyed the whole place. Not a lot of people are actually knowing that the Russian, Russian Federation has been rebuilding it ever since. And they're currently at around about 60% of the city rebuilt with new, new schools, kindergartens, children's play parks, apartment blocks, all brand new to these people. Very, very, very the new and very beautiful. And as a matter of fact, Nate, uh, Peter, we've got Randy Credico, my friend from uh, New York. He's actually there right now and will be joining us on the show this evening. So he'll speak even more vividly than you as to how it has risen from the ashes, a real life. Yeah. Resurrection. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Peter, for that. Mohammed is in Arizona uh, on the peace deal. Uh, Mohammed, welcome to the show. Mohammed, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? very clearly. Go ahead. Yes. Happy Easter, Go ahead. Happy Easter brother. I just wanted to talk about uh, the Middle Eastern peace deal. Um, I believe it is not yeah. a genuine deal done by the Saudis and the Iranians and the Chinese. Um, I think this is an, an, uh, the second wave of taking the U.S. down. The first wave was to take the U.S. down by getting rid of the dollar on most countries where they don't exchange with the dollars anymore. The second wave will be... Uh, is, is this peace deal? Is I think this is led by Saudi. I don't think the Chinese led it. Um, it's because what I believe is that the U.S. their one of their biggest revenues is through weapon sell. So if you make peace, ah, we've lost Mohammed, which uh, is a pity. But I I think I got his drift. Uh, I disagree with it. I think China played the decisive role in bringing Iran and Saudi Arabia together. And moreover, uh, peace is breaking out all over the Middle East. The Arab family uh, ha has received Syria back into its bosom. And the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia himself went to Damascus to uh, invite President Assad to the upcoming Arab summit. Uh, the Arabs are reconciling. I saw a report today that the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah and the Palestinian resistance, Hamas, their leaders were meeting together. The Arabs are 
visibly coming together, the Muslims are visibly coming together, at least in the Middle East, and uh, that is a very significant thing indeed. Now, does that mean that the Saudi leaders or the Iranian leaders are uh, paragons of uh, virtue, that there will be no hiccups along the way? Uh, of course, uh, that's not what it means. But if we can bury the enmity, which fueled not just bilateral hatred between Iran and Saudi Arabia, not just the suppression uh, of Iran's co-religionists in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, if you can uh, dial back, as seems to be happening in the Yemen conflict, in the Syrian conflict, uh, the uh, proxy enmities that have spread out from the central enmity, uh, that's got to be good news, uh, Mohammed. Uh, and you're back on line one. That's got to be good yes. news, Mohammed. no? Yes, I, I heard everything you said, uh, George. I, I don't think it's genuine. I think it is a plan by the Saudis, Chinese, the, the Eastern Coalition, the, the groups that got together in the East, to get rid of the revenue of the U.S. weapons. They make peace everywhere to take down the U.S. faster. First was the U.S. dollar, and they're already doing that. Now they're making peace everywhere, so the U.S. has nowhere to sell weapons. This has to do with weapons. The Saudis were the most well, uh, of the, the The fewer, right. yeah. Well, look, uh, Mohammed, the fewer weapons they sell and the fewer trading there is in dollars, the happier we should all be, even in Arizona, if your name's Mohammed. Go ahead. Last one I'm, to you. I'm, I, I, I agree with you, brother, with the peace. I agree 100%. I want peace, but I don't like this, this, uh, this savior light that they're using where it's like, oh, we're doing this out of our own goodwill. This has nothing to do with goodwill. It is more of to take the U.S. down. If you take away wars, you take away major revenue of the U.S., which already is weak because the dollar is weak. So I don't see this. The, my, my, my point is this is not coming out of goodwill. This is coming out of strategic uh, uh, strategizing. Long live strategic strategizing. Not many things happen in the world on the global level out of goodwill. They come out of interests. And it is in the interests of your country, of my country, of all the countries in the world, to have equilibrium and peace between the peoples. Not because we're all going to love each other or we all want to emulate each other. We all want to, uh, to uh, turn towards uh, someone else's political or economic system. No, uh, we must be free for our own people within our own traditions, within our own national characteristics and psyche, our own history, to make our own path, to write the future for our own country in our own characteristics, in the characteristics of our own language. But if we do so from the standpoint that we will seek amity rather than enmity in the world, that's got to be a massive step forward, even if it's merely uh, a wish to stop buying American weapons and buying them in dollars. Hallelujah, I sing to that. Now, a big thanks if you're watching this on uh, Patreon. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I really depend on my supporters on Patreon personally. Uh, so follow me, please, on patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. And here are some comments from my patrons. Uh, Gordon Lemond says uh, uh, he's uh, he's the only one who can walk, talk, he's talking of uh, Kennedy, I think. He's the only one who can walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time. All America has to do is think that then this is America. RFK Jr. Thanks, Gordon. And quack, quacks, go for it, RFK Jr., if U.S. democracy allows it. And J. Kent Cassidy says, Biden wins. I hate to say it. I hope and pray Robert Jr. could win, but... He's too much for the people, whereas Joe and company are all capitalists doing the bidding of the capitalist stooges who control them. God help us. Well, the worm has got to turn one day, Jay, 
Uh, Monica Ragne says RFK Jr. is a fighter for the people, not just platitudes. The environment, both domestically and internationally, through Riverkeeper, Big Pharma and corruption, my only concern is for his safety. Indeed so, Monica. Paul Cormican says, I would hope RFK Jr. would get the nomination, but the powers that be want Sleepy Joe. Bernie Sanders was stitched up twice by the DNC. The same will happen to RFK, even if he is up against 1% Kamala Harris. Now, coming up in the next hour, it's Georgia on my mind. It's been on my mind for a very long time. We'll be talking to Ilya Lobjandis, who knows a thing or two about the attempts to make a second front in Georgia on Russia's southern border. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. As I say, how lucky we are to have the audience that we do. A million people every week watching all or part of the mother of all talk shows and most attentive to what they hear and many of them truly brilliant students. It's quite humbling, actually. Oh, George, uh, blessings upon your cranium. It's, yes, it's the metamorphosis, man, or me the more for this. The intimations of immortality experiences. <laughs> George, you, you, I like what you said. I, I love a lot of things you're saying. You know, your, your daily communion it, it, with God is through your conscience. I, I wanted to comment on that. That's beautifully said. Your Socratic method on the on-air university is very beneficial, and I can only speak personally. Um, I uh, have appreciated because I had called last time in regard to the general strike, and you helped to really refine my understanding of that from a different point. The alternative point of view. When I heard that last week, and again today, I had this kind of visceral gut reaction to it. And I know what you're what you mean by that. And you know, the Moats audience knows what they mean by that because we're all informed citizens. We wouldn't be here if we weren't. For the the masses who don't necessarily follow uh, geopolitics, let's say, they're gonna listen to whatever the mainstream media tells them. And for them, anything that's alternative the automatic kind of reaction is, oh, okay, it's a crackpot view, it's a conspiracy theory, it's an extreme view, when really it's not. It's, let's call it what it is, it's fact-based commentary. Hello, George, nice to talk to you. By the way, you deserve every penny you get, because you're the only person who speaks the truth over all the fake news. I wanted to personally thank you for um, bringing such great guests that speak about the situation. Also, I have become uh, more aware of, of people like Black Max Blumenthal um, at the Gray Zone and others who, who do update us with the correct information about Syria. And um, this has just uh, been such a great eye-opener. So thank you. You are the people who have stuck with this show and transformed it into a truly global university where it can be said that every month at least four million people will watch this show. They're in Greece, they're in Canada, they're in America, they're in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, they're in New Zealand, they're in Australia, they're in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they're in Finland. They're all over the world. They're in Africa with a call from Nigeria. This is a truly global phenomenon, and that is down to you. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, Georgia doesn't have the worst government in the world, even the worst government in the region. It doesn't even have the worst government that it has ever had. It could be better, but at least it has been determined not to be used, its country not to be used as a knife in the back of Russia. 
at this troubled time of the war in Ukraine. That's made the United States the deep state as well as the superficial front of shop state very, very angry. The Georgian government tried to bring in a law which would force organizations relying on foreign funding to publish the source and extent of that foreign funding. Not that dramatic or radical a proposal, you might think, especially as it was word for word the actual law in the United States of America, which has precisely the same law. And that notwithstanding, the US went bananas and mobilized all their Trojan horses that they have parked deep inside Georgian civil society, as indeed civil societies all over the world, to try basically to topple the Georgian government. They failed to do so, but they did get the law withdrawn. Now their tanks are back on the lawn. Uh, the uh, erstwhile president of Georgia is now running as the hunter of the Russian influence in the state of Georgia. He is trying to get Western support to uh, have another push to overthrow the government in Tbilisi. So let's uh, hear from the front, if you like, from uh, Ilya Lobjanij, uh, I hope I've said that properly, Ilya Lobjanij, who is a representative of the Unified Communist Party of Georgia. Ilya, forgive me if I didn't say your second name properly and feel free to correct me. Uh, it's Lobzhanidze, and it's a great honor for me to be on the show. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I'm sorry that I got the name slightly wrong, more no than problem. slightly. But I don't think I got the politics wrong. You have a government which is not one that you yourself would support, but it's one that is trying to stay out of the war. And you have an opposition in Georgia that paid for by the United States is trying to force Georgia into the war. Is that a characterization you recognize? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, well, uh, we must start with uh, a little history. In 2003, there was a college revolution, as they call it in Western media. So the current opposition was in power after 2003. And in 2012, uh, they got ousted and uh, today's government is now in power. So since 2012, like uh, NGOs got really strong, uh, the Western finance, uh, finances got really strong and methodically they, they infiltrated the, uh, the embassies, the government, the government and other places, uh, other places of power. So. Uh, last year, when this uh, conflict started or activated in a hot conf conflict, as you may say, which was started actually in 2014, we all know, uh, we, we, saw, we got uh, bombard bombarded with uh, different places. For example, on YouTube, uh, we found uh, uh, sponsored ads of uh, armed men with masks uh advising georgians to take a walk in sunny suhumi and tsinwali which are the uh, separatist region capitals of georgia uh, we also uh, had the then ombudsman uh, miss uh, miss uh, nino longaria uh, it, she was a public defender that uh, publicly said that uh, this uh, this uh, in, instead of the shame she would prefer to the bombs to fly over us she, they were feeling shame but now they are acting like uh, they're trying to gaslight us like nobody was trying to uh, uh, drag us into the war nobody tried to at least provoke russia at least uh, but uh, we all have the uh, we all have the videos we all have their speeches when they say, for example, one of the political leaders said that we should at least uh, hold down 10,000 uh, Russian soldiers so to make it easier for the Ukrainians. Or 
uh, we, uh, one of uh, one of the bloggers also said that we should just provoke them so we can be in defending defending side, like this legend that uh, one one to three uh, the ratio would be in our favor in some way. So yeah, it's a pr pretty accurate what you said. So what are the chances of this opposition either forcing the government to change or changing the government? Well, I, I would say that uh, the threat is real, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't show that uh, they have they have actual power to do it yet. And I hope it will continue like that, of course, because um, in Georgia also has uh, a pretty big social problems right now, like 95% of our medical um, healthcare is privatized and all, all, this, all these things are today very, very hard. So uh, opposition is trying to spe speak as this is the organic protest from the, the grassroots, but it's not. For, for example, today it's 9th of April, it's uh, in 1989, it was a tragedy then when the Soviet army uh, uh, the Soviet army killed protests, uh, pro protestants in uh, our central uh, street. In 91, we uh, we had our declaration of independence. So 9, 9th April is like symbolic uh, day for Georgians. So they, they had a demonstration today, but uh, not as much people as they expected showed up. So that's, uh, that's a little hopeful so that, that, they, that they cannot actually do what they want to do. The, these Trojan horses, as I described them, uh, actually Fidel was the first person to describe uh, NGOs as Trojan horses. I was there when he did it. Uh, they are in supposedly NGOs, but they are GOs. They're government organizations. Unfortunately, in your case, they're not even your own government's organizations. They are FGOs foreign government organizations and they litter the landscape uh, human rights liberty freedom free speech free press they give themselves the nicest possible titles but in fact they are agents of a foreign power does the georgian public see that well yeah yeah it it does instinctively it, it doesn't have the like researcher or academic critique of it of course but instinctively intuitively like it's already like maybe a decade that uh, NGOs have bad name in Georgia because uh, we call it uh, grant eaters the, the ordinary people call them grant eaters and yeah uh, like people people understand who, who they are and what they do so there is not much trust in them that's not a problem but they trust but the problem is that uh, the problem is that people don't actually don't actually have time or resources to organize the ordinary people but they do so it turns uh, it always turns out like this uh, this like, amplified voice of these minorities uh, minor they we hear it much more than ordinary people because ordinary people actually do not speak about politics that's that's the actual problem what is the uh, overarching feeling of uh, Georgian people about Russia and about Russians? I myself, in former times, uh, visited uh, Georgia several times. Stalin, of course, was a Georgian and the most powerful leader of the USSR. Uh, Georgia was prosperous back then, one of the most prosperous of the republics. Uh, Georgian restaurants were the best restaurants in the whole of the USSR and could be found everywhere. I don't myself drink alcohol, but people love Georgian wine, they love Georgian food and so on. In other words, in former times, Georgia had a high reputation in the USSR. Was it reciprocated then? Is it reciprocated now? Well, we must say that uh, we got. Uh, you must know the Western uh, Western outlets when uh, the Soviet Union was also already decided that it would be, would, it would broke uh, break up, but it hadn't yet. Like they had uh, statistics of uh, which republic would uh, would be the most successful. So 
uh, in that out in that uh, public publishments, uh, Georgia was considered one of the Asian uh, tigers because it was an industrial agricultural agricultural uh, country republic. But uh, in uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and then uh, you must know the coup, uh, it it got the de industrialized like none, there's nothing else nothing working what was working for them. For example, I'm from Rustawi and uh, metallurgical plant of Rustawi uh, works only the five ten percent of its overall capacity. We have also a chemical plant in Rustawi. It also works maybe five ten percent of the capacity it worked. Um, when or in the time of Soviet Union. So uh, about the feelings, um, it, it's now more of a cultural thing than uh, actual economics. For example, when Soviet Union existed, uh, people, people could uh, ch take a choice uh, ideologically, economically. For example, if they wanted socialism, they knew where to go. Uh, I'm talking about another, for example, African. African if they wanted to so socialism, they can go to Soviet Union. If they wanted capitalism, they could go to USA or Britain. But now it's, it's more like a cult cultural thing, and that's why it, uh, it's more tense. Because uh, the people, uh, the old people most, mostly, and people who have relatives in relatives Russians or they have been or been culturally uh, closer to Russia, they they prefer Russia. But younger people now, because they are already Americanized in Europe, Euro, for example, European in American culture has uh, got into them with these NGOs, by the way, mostly. Uh, they prefer West, so the, these tensions are mostly cultural and uh, mostly, co mostly cultural and there is no more uh, uh, mater material needs or uh, economic uh, preparations now because we all know that Russia is an oligarchy capitalism and the same is the USA if they don't want to admit it, it's still oligarchy. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's now... Uh, not, not as simple to say which, which one people want, but the main problem is as uh, we as socialists, what, what, what do we do? Uh, we, we understand the reality. Reality is that Russia is the biggest country on the earth and it's our neighbor. We are, we are on the south border of it, so if we want it or not, uh, we are on its political gravity. That's fact. We cannot change that. <laughs> most of the people, when, most of the people think that Russia will collapse and uh, divide in 10 or 15 different republics and that's it but that hasn't happened yet and we cannot uh, hold our breath before it does so uh, if you if are speaking realistically on in real politics then we should at least try to uh, calm, calm, our, calm ourselves and try to find some something in common with Russia that's the fact even if you like it or not because you don't you don't try to speak with friends you try to speak with your enemies and yes russia has occupied our territories yes that that's a fact okay but still we have we have to find a common common ground and understand that in right now we are in this in the state of survival we have to survive that's it well, tell them not to hold their breath uh, awaiting the breakup of Russia into 15 separate republics because that way they'll die from lack of oxygen and uh, I wouldn't like that to happen. Ilya, thank you for that insight, that window into Georgia, a place that we don't often feature, don't often hear about. Uh, after this break, it's my good friend, Randy Critical, and he is in Russia, or is he in Mariupol? Let's wait and see. I'll be right back. Donald is in Inverness on Assange. Go ahead, Donald. Hi, George. Good to hear from you again. I'm, I'm phoning about you. Assange, but really your audience is highly privileged to benefit from your international research. 
I mean, I've learned. I've, I mean, tonight you, you told us about the misfired missile and the helicopter crash. We'll never hear that on mainstream news. Last time no. Gonzalo Lira told us about Poland doubling its armed forces. These are very important pieces of information. Now, information no. is one thing, but what I want to do, George, is I want to raise the topic of conscience. But I want to illustrate it with a, an incident that I saw in a documentary in Second World in World War Two. A, a, a U.S. soldier called Glenn Fraser had a Japanese officer sword at his head, uh, ready to chop it off to make him an example to others. And he was told that he would die for having his hands in his pockets in the cold weather. And did he have any last words to say? So this uh, uh, Fraser looked the fellow, this is the Japanese officer, looked him in the eye. And he told the Japanese officer that he could kill him. But he says, you cannot kill my spirit. He says, and my spirit will lodge in your body and hunt you until the day you die. Very powerful, uh, Donald. Uh, I, I too, like you, uh, believe in the judgment day. I believe in the afterlife. I believe that we will reap what we sow. And I agree entirely with the point you make about conscience. I put it this way, that my conscience is my daily communion with God. And if I follow my conscience, I won't do wrong. And if we all reawaken our conscience, as you beautifully put it, uh, then we will have no need for policing. We'll certainly have less need for policing. And heaven knows we could do with that. You know that they speak the best English in the world, in Inverness? And Donald is a good example of it. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, my good friend Randy Credico has been a pillar of the Julian Assange campaign uh, throughout the last decade, and therefore, I have many times crossed his path and he mine. I've interviewed him, he's interviewed me. Randy is a very interesting guy. Once upon a time, he was a, a, a comedian, a raconteur, a song and dance man. In, in Los Angeles, in Las Vegas, he was big on the entertainment scene. Then he experienced some kind of political epiphany and has been a tower of strength for progressive causes ever since. He's got a great, great show on the radio. I commend it to you. It many times featured Roger Waters, for example, and his shows with Roger Waters have been really landmark uh, shows. And then up he pops on my Twitter feed uh, in Red Square, Moscow, and then in Donetsk, which is where we've caught up with him in uh, the former front line now. Uh, solidly a part of the Russian Federation after the uh, referenda that were held in those parts of eastern Ukraine, which overwhelmingly voted to rejoin Mother Russia. Randy, I'll not ask exactly where you are. I wouldn't like to bring down any uh, ordinance uh, upon your head, but uh, tell us about your Russian trip so far. Uh, thank you, George, and uh, thank you for mentioning the show and Roger Waters. And, of course, my last show with Roger was with you, uh, the two of us, uh, three of us yeah. together. Um, I, I'm a little on edge, I must tell you, George. I've been uh, in uh, Moscow last week uh, for uh, four or five days or three or four days, and then I've been uh, in Donetsk, uh, the People's Republic, uh, for the last uh, four days. Today I was in uh, Mariupol. Uh, and so it's 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 um, it's been a very difficult uh, four days uh, down here. I don't want to give you where I am. I'm always looking over my shoulders uh, because uh, over the last five days there there have been uh, bombings. There's been the Heimers being sent into this area by uh, these. I don't I don't know if they're regular forces, but they're definitely Ukrainian forces. Azov Battalion. I don't know. They've hit nothing but civilian targets. And they, their MO is to strike a civilian target 
And then when the emergency services show up, then they strike again. So it's like 20 minutes apart. Uh, I've, uh, I've uh, done a couple of uh, videos uh, from uh, this open air market, open air market where a couple of women were killed. Uh, they destroyed it. Uh, but uh, the next day, they're back in action. Everybody's back in action. And you cannot believe the devastation uh, that uh, is, is foisted upon them. Uh, so um, I'm, you know, I'm not a hero. George, I am not a wartime uh, correspondent. Like, you remember The Godfather when he, he said that, uh, that uh, Tom Hagen wasn't a wartime consigliere? Well, I'm not a wartime correspondent, but I've been foisted into this position right now. Uh, and I got to tell you, I'm, I, right now I'm looking over my shoulder, waiting for a, that, that, the, the fear that the people have to go through every single day. This, these are terrorist attacks uh, by the uh, Ukrainian. They should be reined in because there's no military objective hitting civilian targets here. And that's all they're doing is hitting civilian targets. So I'm like, you know, I sleep one or two hours a day and I'm in total fear. I am not a hero. Tell us how you feel as an American. You say that these are high Mars coming in. Uh, that means they were made in, in America. They were paid for by the American taxpayer. They've been given to the Kiev forces uh, to rain down this destruction, which, by the way, didn't start a year ago, but which has been raining down on civilian targets in that part of Ukraine uh, since 2014. Uh, t thousands must be getting on now for 16 or 17,000 people have been killed since yeah, it, 2014 uh, by these kind yeah. of bombardments. How does that make you feel as an American? Well, no, I know better than you feel as Ukrainian, uh, as a uh, UK citizen, that they're going to be sending uh, depleted uranium uh, to this uh, area too uh, to bombard this region. Uh, it, it, you, I, I, I feel horrible. I'm embarrassed. I tell people this is. I didn't support this. Nobody support. This is a a, a rogue uh, operation by the U.S. government supporting this regime with these kind of deadly. They should be outlawed. Maybe they are outlawed by Geneva Convention using this on civilian uh, populations. And But that's all that's being hit right now is civilian populations. How do I feel? I got to tell you, I was down in Maripool today and I, and, 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 you know, I've been crying all day, George. I may break down Val. Uh, 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 talking to some of the people, uh, this woman, um, uh, uh, Valerie, uh, who was 19 years old, uh, a lot of her friends were killed by the shelling uh, there on the Azov toll, whatever it's called, uh, Azov battalions uh, over the last, uh, way back in March and April last year. Uh, just the entire area looks like Dresden in 1945. This, you got to see what I've got on footage. I will send that out in the next couple of days. But I, as I was leaving, I sat down with this woman, 19 years old. She loves America. She, she was so sweet to me, but she's lost a lot of her friends in the process. And it's like, I, I, I've been breaking down all day thinking that my country is responsible for this. How else am I supposed to feel? You know, I feel horrible. That this woman was so sweet to me. She made me a wonderful pizza. And she said, I can't really talk about my friends who have been killed here. You take a look at the schools, the hospitals, the drama theater there, all destroyed, all destroyed by these Azov battalions with NATO, NATO advisors there uh, on top of this. Uh, it's called the uh, Azov toll. And, 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 and it's a huge multi-plex uh, steel mill and from there they were shelling shell how are they supposed to get the hearts and minds of people in Mariupol when they're shelling them with these uh big guns and then with tanks you see the tank shells going through these little uh houses and 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 and, 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 and school houses it's just it's devastating as an American to see this. And, and of course, I'm, you know, I'm an Italian American and I cry a lot. Uh, but today was, uh, was um, what is it, Good Sunday? Uh, it's a religious holiday here. Uh, and uh, for me, it's Easter. 
uh, but uh, it's 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 really uh, something that it's it's difficult for uh, to me to uh, absorb and to see all the devastation here. And but the the resolve, they're not giving up. I want you to know one thing. What's wonderful about this? They are not giving up. They don't want to go back to where they were before with the Ukrainian uh, leadership. They are part of the DPR, the people in, in, in Mariupol and in Donetsk. They are going to be there until the last person because they've endured this shelling and, and mistreatment and violence since, as you said, uh, early spring of uh, 2014. So I, I don't see them ever going back to the old status quo. Well, you've conveyed it very powerfully. Uh, it is the time uh, of resurrections. And you uh, were in Mariupol uh, earlier, and you've seen the beginning of the resurrection of that town. Tell us about it. Yes, it's really amazing because when you see the, the footage that I have today, uh, all of these, like I said, it looks like Dresden and, and 45, but the, uh, the, the intensity of the bombing is only matched by the intensity of the will to rebuild the city. There were, uh, I, I saw 10 or 12 new buildings, uh, apartment buildings for civilians. That, this used to have 200,000 uh, civilians living here. It's down to about 40,000 right now. And, and you see truckloads, truckloads by the thousands coming in, rebuilding uh, this city. Uh, you have uh, Central Asians who got good paying jobs, who are craftsmen at, at, at building apartments, uh, uh, working uh, day in and day out on Monday through Sunday. And uh, so it's, it's just incredible the amount of uh, rebuilding that has been done in Mariupol. Uh, and, and so it's, it's this, like you said, it's the resurrection. It's the phoenix. It's coming out of the ashes that the Azov Battalion and other rogue elements uh, coming out of uh, Kiev uh, have uh, wrought upon this area. Well, uh, stay safe because we need your voice back in the United States and we'll definitely talk to you again when you've had time to give some perspective to the trip and the experience that you have yeah, been on. You. God bless you on this uh, Easter Sunday. Randy Critical, who is uh, in... Uh, in Donetsk. Uh, have we, just because of the hour, we need to press on. Uh, which Democrat could win the uh, 2024 US election? Assuming any Democrat could, but it won't be Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. Uh, Biden eight, Harris five, Biden eight, Harris four, Biden eight, Harris three, Biden nine, Harris five. Whereas G RFK Jr. 87%, 88%, 89%, and 86%. Someone ring him up and tell him how well this poll is going uh, for him. Let me take 60 second break, count them. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate, great. And I'm Scottish, I'm very passionate about what's happening there, you know. I had a great mom, she was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland and I love the Scottish food. It's great food, I said to Melania, you know, haggis, look at that. What's more than, more Scottish than that? Me, I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, do follow uh, political satirist Randy Credico, that's C-R-E-D-I-C-O. I do. Uh, I hang on his every word. He's, uh, he wasn't funny tonight because his, his whole psyche has been seared by what he has seen in the last few days uh, in Donetsk, but usually he is not just a very perspicacious guy, but an extremely funny one also. So do please follow him. Uh, here are the numbers one last time. If you're in the UK and Ireland, it's 08081965522. If you're in the US or Canada, 
It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the rest of the world, it's four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. Some uh, quick uh, data on the super chats. John Ratliff sends one hundred U.S. dollars. Thank you, John. God bless you. RFK Jr. has spent a lifetime struggling against the tide for causes similar to those which made me act to support his dad in my first political campaigning. God bless you, John, and God rest the soul of Robert Kennedy. Uh, Ma Egg sends five pounds and says, maybe only RFK can sort this mess out, George. Thank you. Matlas X sends five US dollars. Putin's approval rating is rising higher than Biden's in the minds of Americans. Putin for POTUS in 2024. That's actually true, you know. They did a poll, a uh, Gallup poll, I think, in the US to gauge people's attitude to Putin and 20% approval <laughs> for Putin. If he ran against Joe Biden, he might even beat him. Uh, Doc Jazz, good friend of the show, says, uh, sends 100 UAE dirham, which is 21 pounds and 92. Thank you, Doc. Happy Easter to you. As you know, Easter is always a huge happening in my country, Palestine. Shout out to you for always standing strong for justice for our people. We will never give up until liberation and return. Thank you, Doc. God bless all the people of Palestine. G. Convoy sends 20 euros. Wow, thank you. Three bond, three pounds. Back to the lines. It's Simon in Florida. Always worth hearing. Simon, welcome. Thank you so much for allowing me to um, speak with you again, Mr. Galloway. There's a couple of um, very significant developments that I'd just like quickly to bring to your attention. Um, the first, and I'm sure you probably recall this, you remember Mao's little red book that was the litmus test for possession and knowledge during the Chinese culture? Yes. Well, Mr. President yes. Xi has now, has now published his own version of that. It is called um, Xi's uh, um, opinion on the Chinese characteristics of socialism in the new era, that phrase that we keep on hearing. And just as Mao's little red book was 267 quotes from Chairman Mao, this is now 410 quotes from President Xi and all 97 mem million members of the Chinese Communist Party have been told that they should not just read it, but they should study it and implement it. That 97 the public, um, million members of the Chinese Communist Party of China makes you think 97 million members. My goodness. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I haven't seen that book. I didn't know uh, about it, but it is abundantly clear that Xi Jinping is the most eminent leader of China uh, since Chairman Mao. He has the same kind of standing in China. His third term now as president has uh, begun. Uh, and he has overseen a tremendous uh, change in the country for the better. Um, and he is now reaping uh, the fruits, the harvest uh, of all that he sowed in the foreign policy arena in this long procession of foreign leaders going there basically to ask for China's help to resolve their conflicts, to resolve their, their uh, uh, difficulties. So it doesn't surprise me. Uh, I was thinking of, uh, of writing uh, a book on him myself. Perhaps there's no need uh, now that he's done the job uh, himself. But I've no doubt that if God spares him, He's going to be around uh, for at least another five years, and who knows, maybe longer than that. Uh, he's one year older than me, and he's running all of China and beginning to uh, call a lot of important decisions in international affairs. 
I wish him every success. I think he's done brilliantly so far, and all the signs are, certainly I've seen no signs to the contrary, that uh, he is greatly revered, at least greatly respected by the people of China. Last word to you, Simon. So very quickly, there's been an extremely important meeting in Tehran today. President Putin has sent his special presidential aide, who's a man called Igor Leviten. Well worth people looking up that man's background. He's a graduate of the Frunz Military Academy. He was Minister of Transport for nine years, and he's been P President Putin's personal aide for 10 years. He's a really, really closely trusted person. He has met with um, Ali Shamkhani, who's the Secretary of the Iranian National Security Council, but he is also the personal representative of Ayatollah Khamenei. They discussed three issues. One was de-dollarization. Two was Iran becoming a global food hub for the transference of goods from the global north to the global south. And most importantly, they agreed that of all the projects that Russia and Iran are working on, the most important and the one that they're going to accelerate is, as I've mentioned to you previously, the international north-south transportation corridor and they're going full guns on that. So Mr. Ali Shamkhani, extremely distinguished individual, he's actually received, when um, relations were good with the Saudis, the highest possible award from the Saudi Arabian government. And you can see that this network is now forming of these outstanding individuals who are being delegated full authority to negotiate and accelerate deals. To that end, the Saudis have put up a new representative to conduct negotiations on behalf of the entire Gulf Cooperation Council. His name is mm. Dr. Roger al Maruki, And if people look at his background, it's incredibly distinguished as well. So they're not um, delaying in any way whatsoever. They're delegating no, no, authority. Not at all. They're choosing their Finest, this finest is a time plan. of miracles, Simon. This is a time of miracles, metaphorically as well as literally. Jamie is in Malaga in Spain. Go ahead, Jamie. Oh, good evening, George. Uh, thank you for taking my call again. And, uh, you know, I'm a big Welcome. fan of yours. And, and uh, uh, obviously, I'm st still calling or calling again about Julian Assange, and I know you're a, a supporter sure. of his, um, as are many sure. people all over the world. And he re he's about to complete his fourth year in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison in the UK. It's, a, it's ut utterly disgraceful. Um, the reason for calling tonight... He's was been really found guilty to... of nothing, by the way. It's worth making oh, the point. This is four years exactly. in solitary in a supermax with no conviction of any crime. Exactly. It, it, it's utterly dis it was shameful uh, uh, treatment by our judicial system and, uh, and, and our government. I mean, it's it, 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 it despicable. Um, George, uh, the reason for calling tonight is that uh, Roger Waters uh, of Pink Floyd um, you know, is a big supporter of, uh, of Julian Assange's. And he started about two weeks ago, well, earlier in March, he started a tour of Europe, having done a tour of the US. And he's got 30 concerts. And you're probably aware, I'm sure you will be aware, in all of the concerts, he puts, uh, 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 plays a big part, you know, that is dedicated towards uh, Julian Assange, you know, the big screen behind the stage saying free Julian Assange. And, and, and he shows the collateral, ver the collateral murder video uh, of the people being shot in Iraq that kind of brought Julian really to the public eye. Um, something that we're doing, um, uh, part of our sort of support group have got, uh, an agreement with Roger Waters to ha have tables inside the concerts. Um, but I'm re really calling on people to, you know, to go to the Roger Waters website, find the next, uh, uh, you know, the nearest sort of uh, venue that, they, that he's holding a concert and go uh, uh, with other supporters of Julian Assange and gather outside whilst people are going in. Um, really just to sort of help Roger, to help spread the word and keep it, you know, 
pu public's attention to Julian Assange. Uh, and I did this with a, a, a group of supporters in Madrid um, uh, two weeks ago. And it was absolutely brilliant. The people were so receptive and so concerned uh, for, for what my country is doing to this uh, journalist and publisher. So, yeah, a big call out for, for people to come and support Ro uh, Ro Roger Waters. Amen. What a brilliant call, Jamie. Thank you very much. There's an awful lot of emails coming in. Uh, and this is uh, apposite to Jamie's call. Uh, Trump could have pardoned Assange. He instead tried to extort Assange for his source. Julian refused. Trump caved to the deep state. He's not a hero, just another villain in the bread and circumstances. Best wishes from Derek. Another one uh, that's come in just uh, whilst we've been on air. Dear George, many thanks for recommending Rumble because I can now watch RT again after it was taken away by our so-called democracy. All in the name of freedom of speech, of course. What are your thoughts on Poland joining NATO? Poland's uh, long been in NATO. Surely that means more weapons along Russia's border. Keep up the good work. One day the sheeple may wake up. Thank you, Di Easton. Thank you, Di. Uh, I suppose the poll is now closed. 15,000 people have voted and it didn't get any better for Joe Biden and even worse for Kamala Harris. Uh, Takfa Azul sends 10 Canadian dollars, says RFK is too clean to have a slight chance to become president. He is going to be Bernie Sandard at some point in the primaries. And William Cole sends 50 Swedish krona. Thank you, William. Uh, the Salty Skipper sends 10 US dollars. The deep state will never allow RFK Jr. to become president and gain access to the CIA, FBI, NSA secrets, especially the still classified chapters of the Warren Report. And Chuck Skalak, S-Z-K-A-L-A-K, Skakalak, sends two US dollars. Thanks, Chuck. Anthony Hayes, 10 British pounds. Ange, 20, 99, three pounds. Chicka Boom Boom sends two US dollars. The US dollar may soon fall like a stone. Mr. Lover, five pounds. Thank you, sir. American Rebel, 27, 10 US dollars. Brilliant guest, Robert Barnes, he says. And Trevelyan Gale sends two British pounds. Peter Moss, five pounds. Happy Easter, George. Here's my fiver. Good will win. Indeed it will, Peter. Cheryl is in Oklahoma. Let's hear from Cheryl in Oklahoma. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, good day, George. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And I have followed and you, you and admired you for many, many years. But I do have a little bone to pick with you on uh, your trans uh, issues that you discussed last Wednesday. And when you referred to Stormy Daniels as the slatter, and you also referred Referred her to that today, and I'd never heard that term, but I looked it up, you know, and it's a derogatory term for a woman who's sexually active. And I thought, you know, for years and years, men have used so many derogatory names for women in uh, for their sexuality. And I know when I was growing up in America, you know, my father would say, oh, your skirt's too short, you know, you look like a woman of the night or a gutter snipe, you know, the names of women and their sexuality has been throughout history, not only in, you know, other countries like Iran where they wear, you know, the hijab, but in America that women's sexuality is always looked down on. But I think what's even worse than the women's sexuality is the men that have really prostituted themselves for lies and wars and killings. And that, to me, is where the real... Um, outrage should be and you know instead of you know women's sexuality and i also thought you know the trans issue how it affects women but when you discussed it you just talked about the children and you didn't talk about the women being you know erased totally 
So I wanted to. Uh, oh, well, you may, you may, uh, you may have a point. Uh, you may have a point, Cheryl, on the first point that you made, but not at all on the second, uh, because if you uh, study my output, uh, you will find that I am one of the most prominent defenders uh, of women and their rights and their spaces in the teeth of this onslaught against women to cancel women, to drive them uh, out of the positions that they have won through a century and more of campaigning. Uh, many great victories. Uh, women won and won in campaigns and fights led by themselves, assisted by, uh, by willing uh, male uh, uh, supporters like me, but the women were in control of these great fights and they won great victories and these victories are now being taken away from them in the misplaced cause of men's self-declaration of themselves as women. It is another form of misogyny in my view. Uh, but I stand humbled uh, by your uh, earlier points. I was quoting Lionel, uh, although it is a grand old English word, it was Lionel who called her a slattern. Uh, it's not a nice word, but then she's not a nice person. Uh, she did uh, seek to extort a significant sum of money out of uh, Donald Trump and then uh, told about it and then changed her story umpteen times. So if you uh, are saying that I consider her to be a woman of low morals, I absolutely do uh, consider her to be a woman of practically no morals at all. And I certainly don't mean how short her skirt is. But thank you, Cheryl. Always a pleasure to hear from you in Oklahoma. We've got a legend on the line. It's Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um, I've only just rung in very quickly, really, because um, the enthusiasm that this um, Jamie from Malago had about Julian Assange and the 30 concerts and the promotion, and I thought, oh, gosh, well done. But, you know, I don't know if you saw it, but the Archbishop of Canterbury, he put on Twitter... Um, about the sort of Chris Easter message, but and he said about freedom for journalists, but he didn't even mention Julian Assange. And I thought that was pretty awful, really, um, because <clears throat> that's somebody on our doorstep, isn't it? And basically, I mean, you know, they crucified Jesus and they're metaphorically crucifying um, Julian Assange. And... Um, I just wonder what you thought about it. Well, I think you made the point as powerfully as I can. I won't repeat it, uh, except to say this. This apology for a church that is the one that the Archbishop of Canterbury leads, the one that uh, this uh, buffoon King Charles is the titular head of, is, of course, as far away from the revolutionary message of Jesus as it is possible to imagine. They are pillars of the establishment. They're even sitting with their pokey hats in the House of Lords. They are defenders of everything against which Jesus railed. Uh, they are interchangeable with the money changers outside the temple. And above all, they are uh, hypocrites, uh, the worst of all sins, uh, the uh, constant prattle about journalists overseas, Russian-American issues, Chinese-American issues, whilst completely ignoring the existence of, now for a decade, in our own country, a political prisoner, the most famous political prisoner in the whole world, that Roger Waters is going around Europe proselytizing for the release of, that the president of Mexico, the 
spokeswoman of the Russian Federation, the spokesman of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, all over the world, people are talking about Julian Assange except the head of the Church of England when he's in the dungeons of England. I spit upon the Archbishop of Canterbury. I hold them in absolute contempt. A church founded on the balls of Henry VIII was never going to be an institution in which I had great faith. But this current Archbishop of Canterbury, whose son works for Tony Blair, and who cannot find a word on Easter Sunday for poor Julian Assange living in solitary confinement for four years in Belmarsh prison next to terrorists and mass murderers who have committed grave crimes but not as grave as the powerful people in Britain and the United States who have incarcerated them. I I'm going, to take, I'm going to take a wilder here, Norma. If this Archbishop of Canterbury saw Jesus on the stations of the cross, on the Via Dolorosa, being scourged and whipped and kicked and beaten and bleeding, a, th a, a, a crown of thorns forced upon his head, nailed to a cross, this current Archbishop of Canterbury would probably have turned his back and walked away and found a means by which a kind word of explanation, exculpation could be found for the Roman occupiers who were committing this crime. I hope that's not too harsh, but it sums up how I feel about the Church of England hierarchy, who are far more concerned about personal pronouns and however many genders there are than they are about the real message of Christ. I didn't mean to end on a religious note, uh, but as I've started, let me finish. Uh, this is Easter. Christ is risen on this day. It's said that the greatest success of the devil is to persuade us that he doesn't exist. But the devil exists, Satan exists, and Satan is present everywhere. But you know what? I have a distinct feeling uh, that the tide has turned, that the tables have turned, that the Satanists, whether consciously or unconsciously, Satanists who have brought such evil and suffering into the world are on the retreat. And the forces of good, you can call them if you like, the forces of God, you can call them the forces of Jesus, or maybe just the forces of good, of justice, of hack, of right, what's right. We're on the march, and we are beginning to accelerate our march. We're beginning, quite unexpectedly and suddenly, to carry all before us. The devil is on the retreat, and I, for one, find it very easy to say to you this evening, Happy Easter. That poll doesn't make decent reading for Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, but it makes very encouraging reading for Robert Kennedy Jr. Let me tell you that in 1968, I walked down the main thoroughfare in my home city of Dundee, it's called Reform Street. And I saw a billboard which said, for the evening paper, which said, Robert Kennedy assassinated, and in the middle of the street, so I was 14 years old, in the middle of the street I began to weep, as I had for 
his older brother, Jack Kennedy, when he had been assassinated in 1963. The Kennedy family were very important to me, to people like me. We had President Kennedy's picture on the wall in our house. He was uh, the first Catholic president of the United States. We felt that he was a part of us and we were a part of him. He was a good man, Jack Kennedy, and Bobby Kennedy was an even better one. I don't know enough about his son yet, but I'm going to make it my business to know as much as possible about him. But if he runs for president on the kind of platform and program that I've been able to discern so far from his nascent campaign, which was only announced today, I find him a greatly encouraging addition to the contest coming up in 2024. I cannot yet say he has my support, but he has my love and respect because of who his father was and is. Thank you for watching. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back on Wednesday at the slightly later time of 9 p.m. UK time. 9 p.m. UK time on Wednesday for the midweek mother of all talk shows. Keep donating on the Super Chat and on our website so that we can continue to come to you twice a week. Thanks for watching.